There are many instances when we have to do a calculation with some quantity that's changing. And if only that quantity was constant, the problem would be easy. So for example, let's say uh, we have a function. And that function is varying. And we want to find the area between that function and the x-axis. If the function was constant, this would just be a simple rectangle. And then the calculation would be easy. We would just take the constant uh, times the width of the interval. So, But because it's varying, that's what makes the problem hard. And so what we'll do is to break that interval up into tiny slices so that although the function is still varying over a tiny slice, the function will appear to be essentially constant. So, And when we slice tinier and tinier, that will be more and more the case. And so we can approximate the answer by slicing. So when we do that, uh, we call that a, a Riemann sum. The basic idea is always this. You have some interval that you're going to slice up into tinier intervals. So you have a starting point and an ending point, And then you're going to have a certain number of intervals in between. So you're going to break it up into, into intervals there. So there'll be a, a first interval and a second interval and so on. These numbers that form the endpoints of the interval are called partition points. So we could call this one the end of the first interval x1, the end of the second interval x2, um, and so on down to the end of the last interval, which would also be the end point of the, the interval that you're partitioning. We would usually call the left end point x0. So we get what we call a partition, which is just a set of points. A, a far left end point, the end point of the next subinterval, the end point of the next subinterval, and so on to the last end point. So we create this partition. Then for each of these, we calculate the width of that partition. So for example, the width of the second partition we would call delta x2. So in general, delta xi is going to be the, um, the right end point minus the left end point, which would be the right end point of the interval before it. So we have, we have these interval widths, delta xi or I guess I should call them sub-interval widths since we have this main interval from A to B and then these are just tiny intervals within that interval. So sub-interval width delta i. Um, the next thing we'll do is we'll choose a representative point in each interval. So C sub i would be the representative point in the ith interval. So C1 would mean the representative point in the first interval. C2 would be the representative point in the second interval, and so on. OK. What we'll do with that representative point, once we've chosen a representative point within that interval, is we'll plug it into the function. So let's say our function's name is f. Then we'll plug that representative point in to get a height for this slice. And then we'll take the height of each slice, like the height of the i slice, times the width of the i slice. And that will be basically the area of one of these rectangles. And then we can approximate the total area under this curve by summing up all the slices from the first slice to the last slice. This kind of approximation to the sum of a bunch of slices is called a Riemann sum. And you can see that's probably that's only an approximation. In this case, we're trying to find the area between this curve and the x-axis. That's only approximation to the area. But what we can do is to slice finer and finer and finer. So we can look at any partition, and we can uh, assign a size to that partition based on the maximum um, subinterval width. So we could say, if we have a partition p, then if we put p in these double absolute value bars, we call that the norm of p. The norm is just the measure of is a measure of size, and so the measure of size of, the, of uh, a partition will be the maximum gap between successive points. Yeah, so we'll just look at the maximum gap. So we could calculate. Um, this would be the difference between those two would be delta x1, this would be delta x2, and so on. And those are the gap sizes, and so we look at the partition, we'd say um, whatever the largest gap size is, that's the size of the partition.
What we want to do to get a better and better answer is to slice finer and finer so that our function will be more and more approximately constant on that interval. So we'll take the limit then as the norm of the partition tends to zero of the Riemann sum. So for each partition you can calculate an approximating Riemann sum and what we want to know is as the partition gets finer and finer, no matter how you partition it, as long as the size of the partition is getting smaller and smaller, does this approach some number? If so, then we'll say that that is, we've gone from a clunky sum here to a nice smooth sum from the starting point to the ending point of our function times an infinitely thin little width dx. So when you see this notation, the integral from a to b of f of x dx, that's actually defined to be the limit of all Riemann sums as the norm of the partitions go to zero. Let's look some, at some examples of using Riemann sums to approximate, first with a fixed number of points, and then with an, um, an, e an equal number of points that's uh, unspecified here. So this says, set up a Riemann sum using four subintervals of equal length to approximate the area between the x-axis and the curve f of x equals 4 minus x squared on the interval 0 to 2. So here's the integral, interval 0 to 2. You can see when you plug 2 into the function, you get 4 minus 4 is 0. And when you plug 0 in, you get 4. And this function is a parabola opening down. So it looks something like this. Now what we want to do, we want to make four subintervals. So we've got from 0 to 2, we want to break it into four subintervals of equal length. So we br break it in half, that's 1. Break that in half again, and we've got 1 half and 3 halves. So now we have our um, four subintervals. There's our first subinterval, our second, our third, and our fourth subinterval. Um, and we want to approximate the area um, between this between this curve and the x-axis. So we could get an underestimate if we always if we measure the height at the right endpoints of each subinterval. So we could measure the height at the right endpoints. And that would definitely be an underestimate. On the other hand, we could measure, since this function is decreasing, if we measure it on the left endpoint, then that's always going to be the highest point around. And so we could also get an overestimate. We could even uh, choose our represented points maybe halfway in between. So we'd still have a little error, but we would have less error in our estimate if we did that. Let's, let's try it. Um, both ways. First, let's use let's let ci, the ith, the representative point in the ith interval, be um, the right end of each subinterval. Okay. So first, each gap, since we're going over by a half each time each gap is equal to 1 half. And if we're going to use the right end point, then C1 is 1 half, C2 is 1, C3, the right end point of that interval is 3 halves, and C4 is 2. So what we need to do is to take the sum from i equals 1 to 4 of the height of each of the at each of these representative points times the thickness delta xi, which would be the sum from i equals one to n of f of ci times one half. Now we can calculate our function at each of these values. See when y, when i equals one, then we have c one is one half. One half squared is um, one quarter, so we have four minus a quarter times the, that height, which is one half, plus when i is two, then c2 is one, and f of one would be three. And then when f, when i is three, um, c, c3 is three halves, so we plug that in there, we have four minus, uh, three halves times three halves is nine quarters, times one half. And then when uh, i is four, now I need to sum from i equals 1 to 4. When i is 4, then we have um, c4 is 2. And if you plug 2 in here, you get out 0. So plus 0 times 1 half. This gives us um, what we can see is going to be an underestimate for the heights. Let's see. So we have um, 
basically three numbers times all times one half. The first number is four minus a quarter, and then we have three, and then we have four minus nine quarters. So we have for our estimate here, um, four plus four plus three would be 11, and take away 10 quarters. 11 is 44 quarters, so take away 10 quarters would be 34, 34 quarters. We multiply that by 1 half and we get 31 eighths as the estimate of the area. Um, we could also choose our representatives to be, say, the left endpoints, in which case, if we always do the left endpoints, then my first representative point would be the left endpoint of this interval, which is 0, and my second representative point would be the left uh, left endpoint, which is one half, and my third, my third representative would be the left endpoint of the third interval, which is one, and then my fourth would be um, the left hand side there, which is three halves. Again, I can go through and calculate the sum from i equals one to four of f of c i times delta x i. Delta x i is still one half; each gap is one half wide. And so let's see, f of 0 is 4 times 1 half, plus when i is 2, c2 is 1 half, and f of 1 half um, is 4 minus a quarter. So we have uh, 4 minus a quarter times a half. And then we have uh, when i is 3, c3 is 1, so we have a height of 3 times a half. And then finally, when i is 4, the representative point is the left end point, which is 3 halves, so we have 4 minus 9 quarters times 1 half. Now we've actually already um, calculated those three numbers up above, right? They're the same values as before, we just have this extra 2. So we have um, 4 times 1 half is 2, plus the sum of these three numbers we know is 34 fourths. So we have 8 fourths plus 34 fourths, that would make 42 fourths, or 21 halves, as our, our estimate, that's an overestimate. So depending on where we choose our representative points, then we're going to get different answers.